June 1950. Hundreds of North Korean tanks storm across the 38th parallel in a surprise attack against South Korea. The North Koreans were totally vicious. They just kept on a coming. In a bid to stem the invasion, a small, ill-equipped US force is quickly thrown into the fight. It's like Custer's last stand, you know, and you've got to fight like hell to get out of there. It is just the beginning of what will become one of the most vicious conflicts of the 20th century. All of a sudden, all hell broke loose. They were swarming all over us. We was killing North Koreans left and right. This is the battle for Korea, one of history's forgotten tank battles. I can remember how, oh hell, this is it. Panmunjom, Korea. This small village is situated on the 38th parallel, the de facto border that bisects the Korean peninsula. It's a place of hair-trigger tension, where North and South Korean soldiers stand face to face. And where one wrong move could reignite a war that started more than 60 years ago. June 25th, 1950. 120,000 North Korean soldiers led by masses of Soviet-made tanks swarm across the border into South Korea. Since the end of the Second World War, Korea has been a nation divided, with a US-backed republic controlling the South, while communists supported by the Soviet Union rule in the North. Determined to see the two Koreas united into a single communist state, the Soviet Union has provided the North Koreans with military advisors, training, and most importantly, weapons. For the invasion, North Korea has amassed more than 1,100 heavy guns, 120,000 troops, and 250 T-34 tanks, easily outnumbering the South Koreans who are able to field less than 230 heavy guns, 68,000 troops, and no tanks. The South Korean Army was relatively untrained for conventional war, certainly not well armed to fight uh, an artillery and tank heavy North Korean Army. The North Korean plan is to punch through South Korea's weak border defenses, seize the capital of Seoul, and rush south. The invaders are relying on surprise, overwhelming force, and speed. The basic concept was for the North Koreans to plow right through the infantry and then uh, create a mess behind the lines. In, in a sense, I suppose you call mini blitzkriegs. The mini blitzkrieg works. North Korean tanks and infantry quickly overwhelm South Korean defenses along the 38th parallel. By June 28th, they're in Seoul, and they seem unstoppable. The United Nations intervenes, and the US immediately deploys a few hundred soldiers from their garrison in nearby Japan. Their mission? halt the North Koreans and buy time for reinforcements to arrive. On July 5th, the lightly armed GIs of Task Force Smith take up defensive positions near Osan, directly in the path of the advancing North Koreans. I think most of the GIs who deployed really believed that because this was an Asian army, uh, that somehow it was inferior. Well, they found out, of course, that the North Koreans were pretty tough. We got there about 5 o'clock in the morning, 7 o'clock they hit us. So every man start to try to hold a hill. 
They had trucks in the back of the tanks, all loaded with troops. Somebody said there was two divisions behind them tanks that we didn't know. We were outnumbered. We were 406 guys trying to fight a, two divisions and all them tanks. North Korea's main battle tank is the Soviet T-34-85. Outfitted with 45 millimeters of sloped frontal armor and armed with an 85 millimeter main cannon, the T-34-85 is considered by many to be the greatest tank of the Second World War. First guy run down a hill, open a hatch, threw a grenade in. The first tank blew it up. Kind of like sit on a hatch for it so they could jump out, and it blew up. So another guy kept hitting with the, the old bazooka. We thought that bazooka would knock her out, but we didn't. It looked like that if you had a tennis ball, that's how it bounced off. Psst. This one guy put 20 in one tank. Then he knock it out. circle around you and then you gotta, it's like Custer's last stand, you know? And you gotta fight like hell to get out of there. They get on the hill a little bit like that, just like fire artillery. I lost a lot of my buddies, someone digging down in the front there. I lost a lot of them. I still could see their faces sometime. We're fighting to stay alive and this just didn't work. We're pulling the rear guard. And we start trying to, you know, make a position to, to hold them back because we ain't got nothing knocked them out. They had a tunnel. And I see these engineers drilling holes and putting dynamite all over the place. Then they had the plunger, you know. We're trying to get them right inside so that I block the tunnel and when it blows, all that ammo will be blowing all over the place. But the sergeant he got kind of nervous. He says, let's blow it now and get out of here. The old man says, let's start moving back and we'll all get cut off. They were coming like Say 20 to 1. After holding the line for seven desperate hours, the American GIs are forced into a fighting retreat. And by the next day, half the men of Task Force Smith are killed, wounded, or captured. The North Koreans continue their advance and U.S. commanders scramble to get reinforcements into the battle. Soon, thousands more American troops arrive, including an understrength battalion of light M24 reconnaissance tanks. The M24 is designed more for speed than for armored battle. Its hull is equipped with only 25 millimeters of armor, and its main cannon is a low-velocity 75 millimeter gun not designed to take on heavier tanks like the T-34. But despite their shortcomings, the M-24s rush to meet the advancing North Korean tanks. We were taking his ground, and we were at the top of a hill getting ready to go down, and out in the valley, there was two T-34s. The Air Force was coming in shooting rockets at him. They hit the first one, set him on fire. There was two jets, and they took off. I think they had opened up on the other one, and they may have thought they had him, because he quit moving. But after they had left, that first one started moving, and he was on fire. Tank commander said, well, he ain't moving on his own. And he started looking, he says, the second one's pushing him out the road. He's pushing him right out the road. The second one's coming on up. The T-34 
tank commander gave him range, 200 yards. Where you're taking, you get your weapon down to 200 yards, and you get that tank. When you saw him in the crosshair, and you'd fire. The first shot hit right over where the driver. He had his hatch up, and I hit right above it, and it just bounced off like I was shooting that elephant with a BB gun. And the tank commander says, fire at will. Second shot hit him. Third shot hit him. Of course, all three just bounced off. Them people in that tank must have been laughing at me. An 85 millimeter, you better believe it looked like a telephone pole compared to ours. I can remember how, oh, hell, this is it. I said, and that's all I got out. And we were already hit. We were very lucky that he hit where he hit, because that was the thickest part of the tank. The shield on the 75 millimeter. If he'd have hit below the shield of the 75, he would have penetrated it without a doubt. We'd all been killed. It wasn't too long till every tank we had was wiped out in our company. By the end of July, the North Koreans have pushed over 400 kilometers south and have the Americans and South Koreans bottled up in a defensive perimeter around the seaport of Busan. We were scared as hell because we didn't know what was going to happen. We thought we'd be pushed out into the ocean. Because until we got help over there, we were really in big trouble. Very big trouble. June 25, 1950. Hundreds of Soviet-made T-34 tanks lead 120,000 North Korean soldiers across the 38th parallel and invade South Korea. The United Nations condemns the attack, and a small advanced guard of American forces rushes to the Korean Peninsula to bolster the weak South Korean army. But U.S. and South Korean troops are outnumbered and outgunned by the North Koreans. By the end of July, they're bottled up in a defensive perimeter around the seaport of Busan and are on the brink of defeat. The situation is desperate, and U.S. commanders scramble to muster more troops and equipment, especially tanks. We finally arrived there, and I think it's just in time to be able to, to stop the North Koreans. We had a, in, just enough tanks to be able to let them think that we had tanks all over the front, but it wasn't that way. So our, our M4A3EH, we could go 30 miles an hour from one position to another. The Easy 8 Sherman is the main battle tank of U.S. forces in the Korean theater. It made its debut during the Second World War, but what sets it apart from earlier Sherman models is its high-velocity 76-millimeter gun adding a powerful punch to this quick and agile tank. And we were on the east side of the Naktang River, the enemy being on the other side of that river. Our 2nd Battalion had a mission to move on up to high ground on the left of the, of the road. In my tank section, we moved to the right, facing the river, searching for any movement out there. We couldn't see anything. We were just there, watchful, to see what would uh, develop. And something did develop. To my left front and, and, and across the, the, the road, where the, I believe it was F Company moving up on that, uh, on that hill, an enemy tank opened fire on them. I could see the rounds were hitting, at, you know, causing some uh, casualties. 
So I immediately uh, checked to see where that tank was firing from, and I was able to, to locate it by the blast of the, its gun. And we were in defilade position behind this hill. And then we moved on up and engaged that tank. Then pulled back and go up and fire. My primary mission was to draw the fire to me and keep that tank from firing at those fellas that were out there in the open. Then that tank opened fire on me. And we exchanged rounds. It's one particular one that went right over. Uh, we almost had it <laughs> at that time. In any case, I was glad that, uh, that, that the enemy tank had ceased firing. I evidently, it caused some damage on him. So I did my job. Before, we had jet fighters to come in and drop napalm. Everything was quiet after that. Although UN forces are outnumbered, North Korea's attempts to breach the Pusan perimeter fails. Daytime strikes by US warplanes cause chaos. And the North Koreans begin operating at night when American tanks are vulnerable to attack. I knew we were gonna have a, a, a night attack the enemy had already crossed the river onto our side. And if they were there that afternoon, they were going to hit us at night. Tanks at night, uh, if you don't watch what you're doing, you can lose your tank in, a, in no time at all. If they don't know where you are at night, the enemy is going to want to draw your fire so that they can have a better idea of where you fired from. Because then they, their line companies, they can move in on your tank. And that's the reason we don't fire at night unless we absolutely have to. So we had had a, 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 an outpost out there. The outpost has set up uh, booby traps. When that is set off, it has to be somebody out there. So when I heard that booby trap explosion, I'm right away looking, and, and then I see movement coming, and I see them coming. They open fire. One of the rounds that hit my front slope, all of a sudden there's a huge explosion on my face, you know and I, it knocked me out. That, that's when I realized we got a direct hit on our tank. I had a headache for a long time. <laughs> so then I instructed my other tank commander, I said, when, when I open fire, you open fire, and, and then I'll be aiming to the right, you aiming to the left. And then we give them this, you know, the crossfire. So we're going to have people running in away from the, where the tracers are going, and same way over here. So when they do that, then we catch, catch them. And that's the idea. Uh, right after uh, we got through firing, all we could hear was enemy wounded out there. But anyway, we won that night. By early August, the steam has gone out of the North Korean attack. After six weeks of fighting, they've lost almost 30% of their initial strength. And every day the UN forces hold the Pusan perimeter, they get stronger as reinforcements pour into the port city. The North Koreans must act quickly they prepare to throw everything they have left into one last armored assault, hoping to take Busan 
and complete their invasion of Korea. July 1950. After a week of desperate fighting, the outnumbered and outgunned United Nations forces managed to keep their foothold on the Korean Peninsula. Buying time for the arrival of more men, ammunition, and tanks. And while UN forces grow stronger, the North Koreans are suffering significant losses. And by August, their once mighty invasion force has lost most of its punch. With time quickly running out, the North Koreans mount one last offensive, a two-pronged armored assault aimed at penetrating the UN line at Masan and across the Naktong River near the city of Taegu. That's where we saw our first action at, was when the T-34 was trying to come across the Naktong and bust the Pusan perimeter but they never progressed against the M26s. We were camouflaged. They didn't know we was up there. And the platoon leader told us, don't fire till I give the word. He assigned each of our tanks a tank to fire at. We knew the range, we had everything down pat. And then all of a sudden, he said, fire. The M26 Pershing is designed for tank-to-tank -tank combat. Its hull is protected by 76 millimeters of armor and armed with a 90 millimeter main cannon, more than powerful enough to take on a T-34. And we had an armored Pershing cap, and the muzzle velocity was 4,850 feet per second. And when that round hit that tank, I mean, he just lifted the turret right off of it. And it was gone. It hit that just boom, and it just breaks that cast metal up. I think that they were shocked. They never fired around at us. They was trying to get away. Them tanks flew apart all around them. We fired at them and, and knocked out four more. We had no fear of them after a while. We didn't fear the T-34s. North Korea's last big push fizzles, and UN forces go on the offensive. The plan? US Marines will land at Incheon and advance east, while UN forces break out of the Pusan perimeter and push north. The aim is to cut off and destroy the retreating North Korean army. We ran into retreating T-34 tanks. One popped out of a side road or out of a rice paddy, you know, within a thousand yards. Fire moved, fire moved, because you didn't want to stay in one spot. Rounds are going over us, around us. And they shouldn't have missed, but they did. We had a round it, glanced off the turret. But it hit it a glancing blow, so it did not explode. It's kind of hard to hit with the M4, a moving target. So we're bore sighted, you know open the uh, breach and just look down the barrel of the gun. You know, if it was that close, and then put a round in and fire it. The gunner put one right down the muzzle of the T-34. Peeled it back like a banana. They must have had a round in the chamber because the turret just erupted, which was spectacular.
They said that 34 was a good tank back during the Second World War, but the Russians knew how to use their tanks. The North Koreans didn't know how to use them. They were not tank people. So we didn't have too much problem with the tanks. Now the infantry, oh boy, I, they raised all kinds of heck. I mean, they could sneak up on you where they would swarm over your tanks and throw grenades down in, into your uh, engine compartment. The rear tank, he's always with his turret backwards, covering our back. The second guy, he was to the left. Third guy was to the right. Front guy was to the front. And that's the way you covered each other. Yeah, if you get a bunch of North Koreans swarming on the tanks, you just fire on them and start shooting them off. The North Koreans just didn't seem to give a rip when they was coming at you. They were like the Japanese when they had bonsai charge. In one skirmish, I remember that uh, the uh, North Koreans was crawling all over our tanks. Well, the gunner, he just swung the, the, uh, the barrel there of the turret around and knocked them all off. And the guys in front of us seen what was going on, so they just turned their turret back towards us and started shooting them off. They were swarming all over us. We was killing North Koreans left and right. I can remember a couple of times that uh, we get into a firefight and they were shooting their small arms at us. Well, it wasn't just like somebody throwing popcorn against the side of a tin can. Despite desperate resistance from the retreating North Koreans, MacArthur's forces advanced steadily. And by October, they'd driven the North Koreans back across the 38th parallel. American soldiers begin talking about being home for Christmas but they are about to learn the Korean War is far from over. General Mazarta said, take it all away. Four weeks after fighting their way out of the Pusan perimeter, United Nations forces push north, forcing the tattered North Korean army back across the 38th parallel. We were under the impression that uh, everything was over with, we would be home for Christmas. And General MacArthur decided different. Well, they didn't think that we was going to cross the 38th parallel. And then General MacArthur said, take it all away. The 70th Tank Battalion, Big Company, was the first unit to enter Pyongyang, the North Korean capital. And they had tanks dug in in the streets. So what we did, we skirted the city, and we come in from the north, and they couldn't but traverse their, turf, their guns around the fire at us. They, they dug them in. <laughs> And before they could get them out and turn them around, we done wiped them out. By mid-October, U.S. forces occupy Pyongyang. But the war is still not over. General MacArthur, determined to pursue and destroy the entire communist army, sends infantry and tanks deep into the mountainous North Korean interior. By the last week of November, they approach the Yalu River, the border between North Korea and communist China. The night of the 25th of November, we went further north into the Chungcheng River Valley. What happened that night, uh, it always went into a circle, you know. Just like you see a cowboy movie where you have uh, covered wagons in a, in a circle and then the Indians are taking them. I told my, my tank crew, y'all go ahead and go sleep. 
I said, I'll take the first watch. By that time, heck, it was uh, about 9 o'clock in the evening. I looked down the valley, and I could see two or three uh, small bonfires. Nothing moving. Everything was quiet. And I'm just sitting there, and then I start thinking about, you know, go going home for Christmas and what it's going to be, and we're going to be happy and all that. <laughs> and all of a sudden, uh, all hell broke loose. got the worst there. It, it was plunging fire coming out down from, from uh, that high ground. And I said, oh, God, we well, might crank up and we're going to turn the tank around. Instinctively, you know that once they stop, then we would get hit from this side with the same volume of fire. And that's what you call the double envelopment maneuver. Well, I was ready for them. I'm checking the area. And sure enough, I saw this enemy coming up from the river. And when they did, we were already prepared to engage them. Because they had to prepare five AT delaying, 76 millimeter rounds. We're ready to fire. Then I start, uh, I stopped the enemy and stop, who goes there? And they still didn't stop. And I said, fire. So he fired, and that round hit like this and bounced and exploded right over this guy's head. Knocked them all out, got them all. And as soon as it began to get daylight, one individual came running up to my tank and said, uh, Sergeant Reno, can I go out there and, and, and check for souvenirs? I said, no, there's bound to be some live uh, enemy troops out there. He went anyway. And he went no further than, uh, heck, I'd say 35 yards out and turned around and ran just as fast as he could back to me. <laughs> he said, Sergeant Reno, there's a, there's a Chinese out there. What Sergeant Reyna has just encountered is the beginning of a massive Chinese offensive. A 300,000-man strong invasion force intent on driving UN forces out of Korea. seven-week-long advance through North Korea, UN forces reach the Yalu River on the Chinese border. The North Korean army seems beaten at last. But on the night of November 25th, the Americans and South Koreans come under attack. But this time, it is not the North Koreans, but the Chinese. Threatened by the American advance towards their border, the People's Republic of China launches an invasion force, 300,000 strong, to attack UN positions. The Chinese have really had figured out, because they didn't have much artillery, had no air support to speak of, um, that they were going to have to fight us in an entirely different way to get into the rear areas, disrupt the artillery infantry team, and to take tanks out of the the combat equation. It's like a foot blitzkrieg. When they were given a mission, the Chinese, they did not divert from that mission. They kept on coming no matter how many got killed. It's fearful. Because they have no, no respect for their life, why would they respect your life? U.S. and South Korean forces are shocked by the magnitude and ferocity of the Chinese attack. And all along the front, U.N. forces are easily overwhelmed. We looked at the mountain pass where we came up three days before that, and they mined the road over there. There was no way down except down 
the side of this mountain. I mean, it was a steep mountain. Sergeant Mann said, hey, we stay up here and we get killed and we're not gonna get killed. We're gonna, we're gonna get out of here. Old Sergeant Mann said, Billy, what do you think? Billy said, well, let's try her. We can only wind up at the bottom. Down the side of that mountain, you had gravel, stones, shale, uh, like going down the side end of a, uh, of a gravel pit. We slid probably halfway down that dumb thing, but with tracks locked, we slid quite a ways. I'd say maybe 500 yards down that steep mountain off that mountain pass. But Billy kept it right straight down the hill. We got down at the bottom, down into the valley. There was three of us tanks got out of there at that time. The rest of them was still up there. And that's when the second division just got about annihilated. It was a well set up ambush, very well set up. And we got caught in Kuen Ri, what they call the gauntlet. They didn't realize how many Chinese were in North Korea at the time. And then they just started coming and coming. That gauntlet was 17 miles, and they murdered, and I mean, they just caught heck. You get all this equipment trying to come down out of Kuen Ri Pass. Well, the Chinese had it covered on both sides of that gauntlet, and it was just nothing but uh, blowing up vehicles all over the road. We lost probably 3,800 men, I guess, what they told us, I don't know. Wounded, killed, and prisoners. Why, it was just just a big mess, it just like a, it's like a junkyard. But it, it was a scary experience. In just a few days, the Chinese wipe out almost half of the 2nd Infantry Division. It's the same grim story all along the front. And by November 28th, UN forces are in full retreat. We kept withdrawing. We went back south to, to South Korean capital, back south of Seoul. And you know, it's the ground that you fight for and you people die for, and you start withdrawing. Now that really gets to your heart. Believe me, it does. November 25th, 1950. A Chinese army of 300,000 crosses the Yalu River into North Korea. The Korean War, which UN forces thought they were winning, takes a lethal new turn. In just three days, UN forces are in full retreat. By December 15th, the Chinese have pushed them back across the 38th parallel. We kept withdrawing and withdrawing. We went back south to the South Korean capital, back south of Seoul. And we reorganized and started to push back north. We got up here just north of uh, Seoul, and it was kind of raining, drizzling, and a miserable day, and we went up on this mountain. We're going across. That night, fog set in, and like the old saying is, it was thick enough you could cut it with a knife. I've never saw fog that heavy in my life, and we heard these enemy tanks. And we knew they was moving. They gotta be on the road. And we knew that. 
but we couldn't distinguish where the road was at. And we waited and listened. Well, they pull my tank right up where the road dips over and goes down the other side of the mountain. We're sitting there. And I couldn't see nothing. Nobody could. And the first thing we knew, this tank hit us, boom. And we never saw that tank until it hit us. Absolutely, it hit us. And uh, then he fired the gun. And that upset everything inside the tank. We could put our gun over, but we couldn't put it on the tank because it had hit the, the side of the tank. And he, he couldn't get his gun over to knock us out. What I was afraid he'd do is back up and jerk loose and then blow us away. It would have been like a quick draw, whoever got around there first. Yeah, we firing the machine guns. This went on for a while, and we had to get somebody to come over and go around where they could get a, a shot inside the tank. Uh, we turned our headlights on, and in the midst of the headlights, he said he still couldn't see, really see the tank, but he could see what he thought was the tank. So when he fired, it was the tank. For the next eight months, the battlefront shifts back and forth across the 38th parallel, with UN forces gaining ground only to lose it to Chinese and North Korean counterattacks. By the summer of 1951, a year after it began with fast mobile tank battles, the Korean War grinds down into a bloody stalemate. Tanks, so important in the early fighting, are now used mainly as mobile artillery. In July 1953, both sides sign a ceasefire and take up heavily armed positions along the 38th parallel. And now, this heavily occupied border remains a tinderbox. More than one and a half million troops, over 15,000 artillery pieces, and 6,000 tanks are poised on both sides, ready to reignite the decades-old conflict. There is no question that if this should happen, tanks will once again play a critical role on the Korean battlefield. Armor is a combat arm of decision. They're decisive, fast, and they carry a wallet. The introduction of U.S. armor onto the Korean battlefield helped to turn the tide of war against the North Koreans. But these battles proved costly for both sides. In just the first six months of the war, over 60,000 North Koreans are killed or wounded, and US forces suffer more than 25,000 casualties. It was an experience that a young kid should never have to go through. There's a lot of guys who died there, a lot of guys who were taken prisoner there. And I did the best of my ability and tried to stay alive. I can say a lot of it you go through, you try to forget it, but it's hard to forget a lot of it. You just live with it, that's all you can do.